Welcome to Connect with Rohan D. Alvis, brought to you from the studios of uh, Satellite Creations in London. We have today a distinguished gentleman, a true professional, a true Sri Lankan, an internationally recognized Sri Lankan. If Before I introduce him to you, of his background, I would say very warm welcome to you, Sir Arul. Thank you very much. Now for the background. His name is Sir Sabaratnam Arul Kumaran, commonly or affectionately called Sir Arul, who has been knighted by the Queen of Great Britain in 2009. Sir Arul's name was in the birthday honours list for his Knight Bachelor in 2009. He's also a product of Sri Lanka where he had his primary education and his professional education, went on to serve both Sri Lanka, Singapore and the United Kingdom. He is also a former president, in fact the only Sri Lankan so far of the British Medical Association and also the President of the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics, the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. An impressive record, sir. Thank you. I'm very pleased again to welcome you. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I would like to start, for the benefit of our listeners, from Sri Lanka, your motherland and my motherland. Uh, if we can progress from there, to where we are today, I think that would cover a good spectrum uh, of uh, this po program. So, sir, where were you born? And tell us a little bit about your childhood up to, say, <coughs> the university days. Thank you. So, Roman, I was born in Jaffna in 1948, and I had my very primary education in Jaffna. Then my father was a government servant, so he worked in Batiklo. So I worked, uh, I was in St. Michael's Batiklo uh, and then came to Jaffna, Jaffna Central College and Marjana College Telepala from where I entered uh, to do medicine in 1967 at the University, which university? university of Ceylon in Colombo. Right. And then graduated from there in 1972 and we had compulsory service at that time so I did six years. I did obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics and general surgery. And in 1978, I went to the UK for further qualification. Right. So, where did you come over to the UK then? I came and worked in London, Stoke Content, in Wrexham in North Wales, and I worked there for four years in the UK. And 1982, I went back to Sri Lanka and uh, was trying to get an academic job in a university, but it was very restricted because there were only three universities at that time. I see. Colombo, uh, Parodenia, Japan. Go forward, in fact. Right. Um, so uh, the urge for me to do academic medicine made me look at the British Medical Journal and apply for positions abroad. There were positions in Papua New Guinea, and Nigeria, and Singapore. I got Singapore, where I went and worked for 15 years. Started as a lecturer, became an associate professor, professor head of department. And in 97, I was invited to come to Nottingham to start a new medical school. I see. So, in 97 I came to Nottingham and worked there for four years. I was uh, uh, non-executive director of two hospitals to merge it and start the medical school. And in 2001, I was invited to come to St. George's. When I say invited, I had to apply and go through sure. the interview process and so on. So, this is St. George's in Tooting, Tooting in London? That's right. I so, see. 2001 I came to Tooting and was Professor and Head of Department till 2013 mm -hmm. when I retired and I continue as Professor Emeritus there. That's an impressive professional and academic and professional record, sir. So when did you become the uh, President of the BMA or the British Medical Association? Uh, British Medical 2013 and 2014. Right. And the Royal College 2007 to 2010 and the International Federation 2012-2015. I see, I see. Yes, yes. And, and uh, the membership of this, of, of the uh, International Federation is sort of worldwide? That's right. There are 130 national societies, including Sri Lanka, 
and like the American college, the Australian college, Sri Lankan college. So they had to decide on who could be the president. So I was elected as president for three years. Um, Very well done. Yeah, especially from the point of view of Sri Lanka, eh? the first ever Sri Lankan, I guess, on all Thank you. There was another semi-Sri Lankan, I would call it, uh, S.L. Ratnam. He's actually Sri Lankan background, but it was from Singapore. I see. He was president uh, ten years before me. I mean, it's, it's an interesting point you mentioned because the Sri Lankan community, yeah. many are across the globe yeah. and in many, many high level influential positions and sometimes yeah. even in politics across the world. Yeah. And it's, it's an interesting development. I would like to start perhaps from there. So the challenges, rather than call them problems, the challenges you faced in Sri Lanka uh, versus the challenges you found in the United Kingdom. Could you sort of give, give us a sort of a uh, little background about it, if you can, please? Yeah, sure. I think as Sri Lankans, we must be proud of our heritage and the background, because when I was young, I was uh, told in, in, in Tamil, they call Madha Pira Kuru Thaivam, which means mother, father, teacher, and God. Yes. That um, was brought in very early days, because that gives the moral background and the ethical and emotional background for anybody to develop. That's found in every Sri Lankan family. So you, you go and worship your parents, you worship your God, you worship your teachers, you respect them. Your teachers are like ladders, you climb on them. And the father and mother inculcates very uh, good moral standards, like my father used to say, I want to hear uh, people telling that you are a postman but you are a good man rather than listening to somebody saying you are a consultant but you are a nasty man. Because yes. The character is more important rather than the job you do. And similarly, the religion-wise, we were taught that there are still a number of religions in Sri Lanka. There is sometimes unnecessary tension. Mm -hmm. But in reality, if you really look at it, I was also learned from Dalai Lama's teaching, for example. What is religion? He says it's a way of life. And way of life is to think good, talk good, do good. So I used to always think, every day I had to think good, talk good, do good. And I have an exercise book, how many positive points I have had today, how many negative points. And, and also the, our religion, Buddhism, Hinduism, touches the same thing almost. Very much so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they are again, uh, it says that in, in Hinduism, it says that there are three ways of reaching God. One is called Bhakti Yoga. You go to the temple and pray, pray, pray. Or Jnana Yoga. You learn about language and religion and so on. Other one is Karma Yoga, that you work and dedicate whatever work you are doing to God. Mm. Because God has given this opportunity. So I'm very weak in going to the temple and praying. I'm very weak in <laughs> learning scripts. Uh, so I took the third angle of working and uh, to submit that to God. And in the morning when I say, I have a small chain, I just touch and pray, I don't go to special prayer. I said, mm -hmm. when I come back in the evening, I do touch and say Thanks. what I've done. Just to remind me that, you know, I'm not the one who is operating here, it's my divine God. Mm -hmm. And also it says that you have to really do a little bit more than what your job is supposed to be. You know, you can say service, but that add the word sacrifice and service. You have to spend a little bit extra time talking to patients. A lot of patients come back and say, well, the doctor spoke to me something, but I couldn't understand what the doctor spoke to me. Mm. So those values were inculcated in me. So that uh, that was very useful. And that is all done in Sri Lanka. I mean, learn from the teachers there. I follow them in the ward round. Even if I'm not on duty, I used to hang around and assist in operations mm. and so on. Mm. I have fond memories of the training, and I think as a Sri Lankan they can do well anywhere they go, provided they stick to the basic understanding and principles of the ethical, moral, legal drawings of life. So that that initial firm background, the foundation, helped you both in Sri Lanka and abroad, because yeah. you worked in Singapore as well as yeah. uh, in the UK. Yeah. Uh, we. From a Sri Lankan context, we speak a lot about Singapore. I mean, the, the, the famous Sri Lanka to be a Singapore cliche. Yeah. You have 
lived and worked in Singapore. Yeah. Could you give us a, a short summary or a synopsis of the work ethics in Singapore? And again, Singapore, like Sri Lanka, is a multi-ethnic country and they, they do the balance very well, at least to the international world. Uh, and I'm sure you saw it from the inside. A little bit about that, please, for us. Yeah, that's a very important question, Rowani, because um, Singapore has mainly Chinese, which is the majority, 75%, 15% Malays, about 8% uh, Indians or Tamils, and 2 or 3% other races. What they tend to do is an electorate, for example, electing somebody MP, they have three people that are contest in an electorate. And right. One has to be Chinese, one has to be Malay, one has to be Indian to get elected to the parliament. You can't go as a single person. So it's a uniform representative. Then each religion gets a public holiday every year. Mm. So and they celebrate each other's public holiday. They celebrate uh, whatever it is. And also in terms of the merits of promotion. So I went as a lecturer. I was a Sri Lankan. I was uh, to Sri Sidi lecturer, associate professor, professor, head of department. And so, there were Chinese, uh, yeah. local Singaporeans. But you had to outperform them. So I did my MD and a PhD to demonstrate that I can deliver the goods. So at the bottom of Singapore society in the professions and academia, I think it's the meritocracy that absolutely, works. Absolutely. Because it's an important point I want to dwell on because we from a Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan standpoint, not an overseas Sri Lankan standpoint, uh, work on seniority mainly. If I have 30 years and you have 20 years service, I get the job. Now, in countries like Singapore, first hand, and in the UK, and I know it first hand as well, it's a meritocracy. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and whenever we speak to Sri Lankans in Sri Lanka, our friends and colleagues in all sorts of places, politicians uh, and top ranking positions, they always go back to seniority. Now, age and wisdom is one thing seniority without efficiency. Can you comment on that? Because you have experienced this first hand in Singapore yeah. and in the UK. And I have experienced it in the UK. If you know your job, you're, you know, it's the meritocracy that works, not how old you are. So the way the system operates in Singapore as much as in the UK, as you mentioned, is that uh, they assess you based on what you have done, what you are currently doing and what, you are, what is your potential of doing something. The potential of doing something is not purely what you can do for yourself, but for the organization. So I think you should build that organization. Say, for example, when they invited me to Nottingham, I was in Singapore, I was head of department, um, good salary, good everything, but my family was here, so I was tempted to come and apply. But I didn't just blindly take the job, I sure. came three or four times and uh, went and visited the hospital, the department in the university made points as to what is the research they are doing, teaching, clinical work, how can I improve this and then wrote a report about it mm. and said this is what I will do if I come and uh, this is the funding we need, what these are the people we need, etc. to be head of a department and to progress it forward. Mm. Same thing I did when I went to St. George's. I visited St. George's six times, went from Nottingham to London six times, made notes. Because I think what is important is the job when it is applied or when it is advertised, you have to read the job description carefully. Mm. Mm. And there is a proverb which says that if you look at a job, one ad advertised for a head clerk and another for a manager, and if you are contemplating which one to apply, then you are not fit to be a manager. Sure. You are fit to be a head clerk. And you have to prepare. Prepare is actually power. Preparation is really planning is power. So. Same I did with St. George's, I have him for the interview, I had no difficulty. Mm. Um, so you have to show that what you have done, uh, what you are doing, what you are capable of doing, if the opportunity is given to you, uh, rather than saying I can do the job. Mm. How can you improve the organization, improve the younger people to come up, uh, build them up so that they can continue on that stream. So that's what I did. and. Uh, very happy there are so many of them who are trained under me are professors in different places so mm. we just mm. and we are in touch and, and that's the that's the delight we get absolutely and it takes me to an interesting point uh, Sarul um, you came to the UK to set up a medical school if that's, that's right yeah, at Nottingham 
Then you came over to St. George's in London for a similar type of activity, a project. From the point of view of the United Kingdom, here is or here was a non-resident, a foreigner, a Sri Lankan working in Singapore for 15 years, yeah. being asked to come over to the United Kingdom to set up a, a medical school. I mean, I'm asking this question slightly tongue-in-cheek because I'm thinking, could we invite in Sri Lanka a foreigner yes. to come over to Sri Lanka, who is coming from another country, <laughs> to set up an educational institution or a professional institution? So I think that's the possibly the cultural difference we need to bridge. The person who can do the job the best should be given the opportunity. Uh, if, if the United Kingdom or the Singaporeans said Singaporeans first, that's fine, I'm sure they have that, like in, in Malaysia and the Bhumiputra policy. Uh, but again, that's another thought process for another day between the policies in the Bhumiputra policies in Malaysia and the Singaporean, uh, the, the total meritocracy, that's for another day. So, did you have any internal resistance from those inside the universities or at St. George's because here is an outsider. Even if you were working in Nottingham, coming over to London and telling people this is how it's going to be done, uh, how did you uh, uh, pro progress that challenge? Yeah. Well, I think it's an important question, Ron. The, the issue is actually good communication, good planning, good communication and inclusion and non-partiality. So when you go to a place, you include everybody in the process because everybody has to jump with you over the rope if you want to progress. Yes. And you, they say you walk together to reach far, so you carry them all through. So you have to have planning. So I had, when I came to St. George's, for example, I had all the academic staff, I called them one by one, sat them, talked to them for a few hours, and then I said, you're like a coin. This is your coin side in your hospital and the university. I want you to have another side of the coin, internationally, professionally, publications, etc. So I will help you to do this A, B, C, D, E, F. So individually you try to promote and help them and also as a department I want you to do this to, to promote uh, this aspect. So you have to really, inclusivity is quite an important one. Mm. Trying to help them develop themselves is something important and how we can try to develop the department through their activities mm. that they have. I mean, there are so many of my uh, former staff who are editors and various other things. That's the five you get. You, you stay in the background and you push them and find opportunities for them to, to do that. Mm. Mm. And uh, the question you asked about why did they ask me to come and uh, help with the setting up of the University of Medical School in Derby, that's part of Nottingham. Uh, because they wanted to start a medical school because uh, initially there was a report called the Campbell Report mm -hmm. which said we are registering 3,000 international graduates every year mm -hmm. into the General Medical Council. So we are stealing 3,000 doctors from other countries. So during Tony Blair's time this Campbell Report said you had to form 10 new medical schools. Mm -hmm. So they decided to start one in Derby, one in more each one in Bristol and so on, not in uh, Brighton and so on and so forth. So at that time they were looking around and they wanted some senior people. So I was not the only one because there are the professors of medicine, zoology and so on and so forth. Mm. But I was out of that lot, they asked me to become the non-executive director of the trust because I could bring a different experience having worked in Singapore uh, and so on. And I think they, they identify people. They were, Many years ago, there was a problem at Northwick Park Hospital in mm. London. There were 10 maternal deaths in three years, which mm. is uh, about 10 times greater than the national record. Mm. There were so many professors around, they identified me and asked me to um, go and sort of solve the problem. Mm -hmm. So there again, when I first went there, the consultants didn't want to talk to me. They are looking the other side. They don't want to attend meetings. But then I individually gave them the time that they ought to come at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, I will wait for you. Just accommodate them. Accommodate them and sit them and say, okay, here we have a genuine problem. Uh, if it is your mother or sister or somebody, you, you want to give the best care possible mm. and this is what we want to do. Mm. Of course, in the process, we had to suspend a couple of people. Mm. Um, 
and ask them to do something else instead of to do maternity and so on. I think that's also important. We normally say in Sri Lanka, don't break the rice bowl because that's a bad thing to do with somebody's earnings. But if it is going to affect somebody else's life and health and so on, then we have to take that uh, risk. Risk and the impartiality. Uh, impartiality. I have to explain to them, not that we dish them out totally, find them something else to do, mm. but not necessarily what they are doing. Mm. So you have to find an escape route for them. So you do outpatients clinic, don't work to the maternity label or something. Mm. So I think it's the things we have to do when we are asked to do a difficult task is to do it, but how you do it is more important than what you achieve it. And mm. same way I was asked to chair the inquiry of Savita Halapadava in Ireland, mm -hmm. which brought about the reaction about uh, amending the Eighth, uh, eighth Amendment to be reversed and they had a referendum, so I had to go a number of times, I gave the report and I said the legal situation has to be changed. Mm -hmm. So you had to be a little bit bold, but you had to explain the situation to parliamentary groups and so on and so forth. So, there were difficulties, I wouldn't say no. And, and of course, that's, that's how life will be, whether it's personal or professional. Yeah. But it's the, the problems or the challenges, then how you overcame them is, is admirable. Yeah. Uh, and it's, that's, I think, hopefully our young viewers and uh, those in Sri Lanka and overseas, uh, uh, the, more, uh, the, the, the parental category would see the, the subtle messages we are sending the, the what's important in in a in being a successful professional uh, in in real life uh, I think preparation to a very strong degree prepare always prepare and then uh, execution of it impartiality include everybody but be brave enough and confident enough to make a decision. I think that's that's where you have yeah, all and the, the other thing I might add, uh, Ron, is the, the opportunities do come your way. Mm. You have to sometimes go in search of it. You can't just sit down and say, this is going to fall on your plate. Say, for example, I was uh, over Christmas time and I was in Nottingham, I read some advertisement. There was a good journal called Best Practice in ONG and Research. So I applied for editor-in-chief job. Mm. Uh, everybody said, you're not going to get it, uh, you are uh, not an uh, internal person here, and so on. I got it, and I ran it for 21 years successfully. Now that gave the visibility for me to proceed to the Royal College and mm. so on and so forth. So mm. I think you have to really venture out a little bit uh, yes. to seek for opportunities, what you can do, and take things that you can do. I think that's, that's very important, yeah. you know, seeking challenges and opportunities yeah. both and these don't come and be offered to you. Yeah. Uh, that's something that I think overseas Sri Lankans are, are really, uh, they, they excel in. Um, Sir Arul, you have now retired and you're spending your retirement in the UK. Uh, what are your links back to Sri Lanka? I know we have had the COVID issue and all of that internationally, worldwide, but subject to that, I would like to hear what your links back to Sri Lanka are at the moment. Uh, my links are mainly professional links uh, and I work very closely with the Sri Lankan College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So what I have done is actually to promote how to do international research. Mm which is very relevant to Sri Lanka, for example. So I got a uh, grant from the Buffett, Susan Buffett Foundation mm -hmm. to work in six countries, Tanzania, Kenya, Nepal, Bangladesh, India, and Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka was the initial phase we started, and we worked in nearly uh, 18 hospitals there. And the purpose was actually, there are young mothers in Sri Lanka who are 20, 25, mm. after they have two babies, they get sterilization as a method of contraception. But when the tsunami came, they lost the children who were 10, 12, 15 years of old, and then reverse about the mm. Mm. So I decided we should get some funding to do work in Sri Lanka to give reversible contraception. I see. So like a implant or an intrauterine contraception. So I worked with the Sri Lankan college nearly for eight years or nine years, and introduced and it became the government policy. Um, so to offer that, not the woman can select what she likes. The choice. Choice. You can put a coil in, take it out of three years, put an implant, take it out of two years, or keep it for ten years mm. if she wants to. Mm. Mm. Then the other thing I did was the the Plankin College, we want to promote research. 
So I established five fellowships by giving funding. Uh, so it goes on my name, of course, and uh, every year when they have the annual scientific sessions, we select the five best papers and promote From Sri Lanka. From Sri Lanka. So this is a Sri Lankan college. Then I established a professorship uh, for the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, spent some, some money, and then I worked in the Columbia Medical School to convert the quadrangular area into a garden area where the students can teach and so on. It's not my money, but you know, collected from sure. here, they're all over the place. Uh, worth 35 million rupees or something and mm. transform that area. So mainly my connection is not very much with the public, mm. but with the medical school and mm. the Sri mm. Lankan college because mm. I was uh, having an easy approach through them because I knew them, they knew me and so on. Of course, on. yes. And so I traveled three, four times a year to Sri Lanka till the COVID came. And the last time I traveled was the 150th year celebration of the Sri Lankan Medical School. I see. So I went as chief guest and told them a few things about mm. how we should proceed. Mm. So I still have connections, but uh, I'm afraid it's mainly confined to my profession rather than to wider areas. Yes. yes. Currently, of course, um, the new governor of Northern Province contacted me with the health leaders in the Northern Province because we uh, have lagging behind in tackling non-communicable diseases and so on. So I have a group working, I have linked a professor of health systems from Harvard and we work together on the Zoom and so on. I haven't been there. Mm. Uh, try to give some advice and so on. But I communicate with the head office of the health department. In Colombo. Right. So the director of non-communicable diseases, uh, so we liaise with the department, the data capturing system electronically, we liaise with them. Mm -hmm. So it's, although it says it's a northern province governor I'm working with, but it is with the health department so of that course, every, yeah. everybody is uh, moving in the same direction and mm -hmm. uh, holding hands and directing. There's no point creating a data system for the whole of Sri Lanka and a separate one for... Yes. Uh, so first it must start in Colombo and test it out and so on. If it works, then you plug it somewhere else, plug it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. No, no, that, that's, that's uh, something that I wanted to hear from you, your link back or the, the not the brain drain, but the gain back to Sri Lanka, regaining yeah. what uh, you have uh, and, and, and contributing back. Now, as a medical doctor by profession, initial qualification, I mean, what advice can you give? Because I, I'm a lawyer and the way I see from the point of view of a Sri Lankan professional, what we are lacking is not the education in ethics, but ethical practice or ethics being practiced in reality. I'm, I'm concerned and I have certain reservations, but they are mine. How, how do you feel about the professional ethics in with the general public, in this case for a medi medical professional with the patients in Sri Lanka? Well, it's an important question, Ron. I mean, I think the medical ethics is breached uh, in every country of the world. People mm -hmm. do unnecessary operations, uh, they do transplants from people wanting money and so on and so forth. So Sri Lanka is not an exception. You know, they have breaches of ethics in their practice till 12 midnight and so on mm -hmm. and so forth and you only have very little time to be. So the way I look at it is actually to inculcate a culture in the, in the society as such, uh, so that they, 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 they provide enough for their family, mm. but beyond that they shouldn't have agreed to earn money and uh, shortchain the, the public in some way in servicing. Mm. Mm. Uh, there's always this uh, issue which I learned saying that uh, people earn earn and they want to have a house near the river, house near the mountain, so they say, um, the fools build houses and wise men live in it. The right. wise men are the children and the relations yes. and so on. So I think uh, I don't have... Uh, That's a very good one actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the second thing is actually we have to recognize that um, like the Buddhist philosophy, you, you have a birth, you have a old age, you have illness and then you die. I mm. mean, that's, you can't take uh, everything with you. Mm. And if you mingle with the Chinese philosophy which says uh, uh, the most important thing for people is uh, money, energy and time. Mm. And money is important as everybody knows. Energy means health and happiness. You mm. have to be able to have a good life, to live life 
then you must have energy which is health and happiness. And of course the third factor is time and we have we have to inculcate from the early days. The younger age when we are going to school and university, the God gives you only two things. The energy and the time. He doesn't give you money. Mm. In the middle age, he gives you money and energy. You're working, working, working. And in the old age, he gives you time and money, but no energy. You have yes. arthritis and heart disease and cancer and everything. So how do you balance these things? You have to have a plan, something like a five-year plan. And the way to think about it is actually to reverse the philosophy mm. based on the religious things. How do you provide benefit for the public if mm. you have enough? Mm. Mm. You know, there's always this word called God plus jealousy is equal to man. I see. You know, so if, if, if they don't have jealousy, man minus jealousy is God. Yes. yes. So that is the equation. So how do we really reverse this philosophy at every stage of life mm. and give the public some amount of money, some amount of your time, some amount of your energy in some way. Not that, you know, you know when I'm working, um, till I retired, I gave little money, um, but a lot of time mm. and energy. After I retired, I give uh, some money, a little bit more than before, because I know how much I need. And generally, if you get 70% of what you've got when you're working, that's enough for your retired life, mm. because you don't have the other luxuries. And then I give a little bit more money, a little bit more of my time to teach and so on, mm. and my energy. So some people are unable to do that because they get ill health or they don't have enough money and yes. so on. So, that, so the money, time and energy is a good equation to think how we live life. And uh, I think the ethical code of conduct of the professionals have to think about these principles that uh, the Buddhist philosophy about birth, Mm. old age, illness and death and that is the basic fundamental applying to every single individual and within that time period how do we really balance the Chinese philosophy of money, time and energy? And I mean that's that's a very important uh, message we are sending out to our viewers and listeners and especially the, uh, the uh, professionals in their middle tier Yes, the I, what I call the 35 to 55 year old professionals, not necessarily just medical professionals, but Sri Lankan professionals, yeah. because we are caught in a rat race yeah. where we think of not just providing for yourself, but for your immediate family, which is fine. And then when the family is big, we still keep doing going on the rat in the rat race rather, uh, trying to earn for many generations to come, and that then becomes a futile exercise because you're going to get exhausted yeah. and just like the race or going on an yeah. escalator you start running yes. you you get tired and you get stressed you get um, so many things and I think uh, even if somebody is working as a Sri Lankan in a factory and that person doesn't have the potential like a doctor or a lawyer to give very much but if that person in the factory can help this community in planting the garden or whatever it is, or helping some old people or taking them to the hospital, that itself is service and sacrifice. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. I think uh, in the Brief Medical Association when I was there, I was talking about three things I wanted to change. One is about human rights for health, second is about the climate change, and the third one was increasing voluntary activity, because I think a lot of people can give voluntarily. Mm -hmm. If they can't give money, they can give in terms of time, their energy service. and so on. So, service. so I think Sri Lanka is, uh, people are very nice, they are good, uh, but you know, if you go to a village, I can still remember as a child, we were from Barikla, we were going on a, my father's circuit, a tire got punctured, the poor family took us into their hut and gave us papaya fruit to eat while they removed the tire, got it filled and brought it back. And I uh, don't know the people. Absolutely. And we offered some money, they said, no, 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 we don't want money and so on. So yes. that's the culture of Sri Lanka. So I, I can remember that very well in mm. Paul Narva. Um, so I think uh, it's actually to, from the young age, young students, we have to inculcate that, you know, be of some help to your community, your society. Mm and get as much as needed for your family, but beyond that, mm. try and give your time and energy and money to the others to uh, thrive. I mean, I think that's the philosophy. And, and what's the message 
or perhaps the advice, maybe the younger generation would not necessarily want to use the word advice, but uh, um, to aspiring medical students, I mean, the likely audience here is those who are doing their A-levels, wherever oh, they are, okay. uh, from a senior medical professional uh, to a, an aspiring medical student. Yeah. Is there a message that you... Well, I would, I would package that into uh, compartments of three. They initially, you had to think about your respect for your parents, your teacher, and religion. Mm. Religion is actually servicing the other people in some way. Mm. Then the second package is to see when you take the job, take the appropriate job, don't go and take a job which you can't do. You plan well ahead of time what you have to do to promote not yourself but also the organization per se and don't get stressed in the job. The stress in the job is very common. You try to take too much than what you can do and then you get stressed and try to help people who are in stress. Say for example if you are driving from here to Nottingham and you have to reach a certain place and Suddenly you decide you want to deroute to Leicester halfway through to meet a friend and then you come back, you lose time and then you get stressed. To you. So don't do things if you have to do that. And also don't try to argue unnecessarily. Say when you are having a goal, you walk straight. There are people who will be jealous about you. There's no question. That's the world. And uh, when they put some blocks to you, complain about you and so on, if it is something which you don't have to worry too much. Treat them as pinpricks in life. Mm. Rather than they are shooting arrows, then you pluck it and try to shoot the arrow to that guy. Back. Then you are wasting your time, you get stressed you're mentally, physically and you will never reach your goal. Mm. Mm. So that can happen with, from your own staff, you know, the secretary might not type the letters in time mm. and you get the blame for that. So you speak to them nicely, otherwise you identify somebody else who can do that. Mm. Uh, so trying to delegate and trying to get other people, get the juniors to train well so that they can come up mm. and they can do a good job. So it delegation is quite important in addition to communication. Now that, that's, that's really useful advice uh, or thoughts uh, for our younger generation. I'll now reverse back to the parental generation of our viewers. You mentioned, you mentioned the advice in three compartments, you said. The first one, parents, and I, I'll get this wrong, but parents, religion, and was teachers. Teacher. Parents, teachers, and religion. Now, we are living in the West. The Western education and the culture is, there is no respect-based culture. And some of the Sri Lankan, well, not almost all the Sri Lankans living in the West, are growing in a Europeanized, Westernized culture where there is no respect but equality. How do you balance what you said with sometimes reality in the West? Yeah, I think we have to inculcate in them that um, starting from the mother. Mm -hmm. Globally, you know, there are half a million women who die during childbirth. Um, and even in Sri Lanka, now it's about 38 per 100,000 women die. 38 per 100,000 women. It fluctuates between 32 and 38, 38 yeah. yeah. Mm. So when a mother goes to give a child birth, she is risking her own life to give birth. Then she is nurturing you as breastfeeding, nutrition, taking you to the hospital, making sure everything is done for you and so on. And so she teaches you the emotional aspect of life. How do you... And the father has to teach the moral aspects of life. Mm. And the moral aspect has to be important because, and, you know, for example, when my own house officers get married, they come here with, for me for advice. I mm. said, you have your life, but don't raise your hand against your wife. Don't use bad language against your wife. Don't raise your wife. Right? So that is the basic principle. And try and cooperate as much as possible. So you have to tell the, the youngsters that you have to do your job but amongst your friends also, don't use bad words, don't use, uh, raise your hand. Don't so that's the mutual respect to respect our community. Community. That's right. So that moral aspects of it, your father or the, whoever who has mm. a little bit of command over you can teach. Mm. So I think the Western values and Eastern values we always consider, but we have to, if we are living as an Eastern and the Western, we have to teach them from the very early days. Yeah. Respect is an important one. When I do interviews for, Recruit a consultant, we say, please come and sit down, we ask questions. 
if the person doesn't use the word sorry, mm. please, uh, etc., which is just whenever they answer the question, I have a bit of a suspicion about the individual because, you know, it's a bit arrogant or something mm. like that. Mm. Mm. Because you need somebody who admit to, even if you don't hear, you have to say, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't hear what you said, mm. Mm. and can I clarify your question, please, or something like that. So the words are quite important, whether you are living from a young days, married life, and so on. So I think the question, how do the parents in the Western culture is, you have to teach the children from the very young days mm. about the importance of respect to parents, teachers, and the religion, and what it brings back to them mm. as an individual, because they want themselves to be respected in the community. That's fascinating, Sir Arul, uh, the relationship and the nurturing by the parent, parents of the children. Uh, and the, uh, what I ask you as the, the, the disconnect between Eastern and Western society. Perhaps one more question on the same topic. In a Western world, where you have young parents living a Western lifestyle, how would the, for example, we, we spoke about parents, but there could be single parents, both in Sri Lanka as well these days, it's, it's happening. And that's a social uh, effect of uh, uh, the new culture. Um, how do you uh, bridge the gap rather than reconcile the, 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 the disconnect between the children and the parent or parents uh, to make them better citizens for tomorrow? Yeah, that's an uh, important one, Rohan. If, if you remember, I started by saying, uh, parents, teacher, and the God. That forms the basic foundation of life. So if they have lost that opportunity, then however much you try to correct them down the line will be difficult because the mother or father who has not really inculcated the cultural values, which is very strong in Sri Lanka, if they grew up in a different angle, then you can advise them, but they may not listen to that mm. because for mm. them, materialistic uh, things and emotional things become more important. Mm. So they can go in a different direction and the child might suffer as well as the parents will suffer. So if somebody is a relation or a friend, they can advise them and try to get supportive help from the parents or grandparents or something to support the child and give the child the love and the affection which is needed. So that can be corrected to some degree, but if they are going at a tangent after having lost the moral compass, Mm. then it becomes difficult to bring them back. Mm. It will come back for a short time, then it will go back. It is like we talk about fetal origins of uh, adult disease. That's a, a medical concept. Mm -hmm. And we think if the child is born very small, preterm, growth restricted, if they eat too much, they can put on weight and so on. But research now shows that too much eating, uh, dibbling habit, sedentary life, mm. um, all these things put together is the one which is causing the obesity, I which see. everybody knows, mm. but from the childhood. So 13-14% are obese from the adolescent group. Mm. So that is something you can't change. So you can change something, but not totally. Um, so I think it's quite important that from a young age, because the, the knowledge is not known in the past, now it is known. Mm. Uh, so they can try to build the family. And similarly, more than two hours of television watching of a child, uh, which they call the blue light phenomenon, mm. creates problem for the child in the learning. Mm. Mm. Uh, but now, as you ask the question, single parent, mm. what do they do normally? They are busy, they put the television on and let the child watch the television. So that might go on for four to six hours. Yes. So it has a vicious cycle. So I think the fundamental thing is we have to keep to the Sri Lankan values uh, from very early days. So the moral, ethical and emotional compass is set by the parents, teachers and the religion. Then it's very unlikely it will go wrong. Now that's, that's a very good point because uh, it reminds me of the uh, Eastern values versus Western values, the community program. I think uh, the Association of Professional Sri Lankans, APS, has run in the UK. So I think it's, it's very important the fact that you are able to, in our discussion today, to bridge that gap or perhaps talk about the, the issues quite openly. 
Um, going forward, so uh, again, I asked earlier about your links to Sri Lanka, but what are your personal thoughts of uh, uh, the future, both in the, in the UK and in Sri Lanka and across, from a personal perspective? Yeah. I think it's, it's an important question which I raised with some politicians in the past. I met the health minister, the president and the, everybody, you know, um, and now I'm talking to the government. I think that there are a few things which they can do very easily. First thing is actually the government has to put the government optimal lands which are not utilized, mm -hmm. which are barren lands, not forest to cut it down, but barren lands. And to see whether they can get wider interest in putting solar villages like Dhamana, you know, so that you can yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. like electricity generation or a wind farm or something, because they are the generate income. The second actually is there is a dearth of uh, medical schools in Sri Lanka who are giving private medical school education. Children from Sri Lanka, the parents sell the houses and they send them to China, Bangladesh, they go, they come back, they can't pass the qualifying exam. If they have a private medical schools in Sri Lanka, they can attract international students and this is actually, they are charging something like 30,000, so I'm foundation professor in Cyprus, you have a private medical school yes. and uh, we earn a lot of money there mm. and there are a number of hospitals, the advantage of putting a private medical school in Bavania for example or some other place is that place will develop, you give employment for mm. the people. Mm. Mm -hmm. And also you generate, these doctors will go abroad and work, mm -hmm. and they need not be Sri Lankans, they have, yes. and you give more employment as the staff to cater and so on and so forth. That's another interesting point you raised, uh, Saru, because uh, if you set up a, a, a university, whether it's a private medical college or an engineering faculty or anything else, you could attract foreign students into the Sri Lankan schools and that also will help us in getting the precious dollars, the US absolutely, dollars, absolutely. and then the dollars will flow in. Equally, as you said, uh, the, the area in which the, the place is uh, operating will become a more of a commercial hub, the businesses, the small businesses and all of that, so the community will benefit. And um, uh, it will also provide a platform to stop the pounds or the sorry the rupees from going in right, outside right. as dollars or pounds because uh, a lot of Sri Lankan parents they I know uh, they sell their properties if, if perhaps if they have only one now they'll sell it and uh, send the child abroad and when you say abroad it's no longer the UK they send them to India as you said Bangladesh Nepal to Ukraine Ukraine and all of those yeah. with their rupees being sent out of the country. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a sensitive topic that you referred to about the private medical colleges because politically and nationally, nationalistically there, there has been a backlash from time to time each time we've had a private university type medical in, ins, institution. Uh, no, that's, that's a very good point. So uh, both politicians and uh, those who are in academia and the private sector, uh, Professor, sorry, Sir Aru mentioned about the the private uh, medical school in uh, Cyprus, in Nicosia. Yeah. Uh, so those are the aspects that we can sort of learn, not just the professional aspects, the academic aspects, but also the public-private partnership aspects. Absolutely, absolutely. So Arul, I understand you are not only not been knighted by the Queen of the United Kingdom, but also uh, you hold the title uh, of Sri Lanka Ranjana from the Sri Lankan government. So it's an impressive uh, uh, honorary uh, title. Um, for the benefit of our viewers, uh, could you tell us the practical aspects of the knighthood process and that sort of culminated in you going before either the Queen or Prince Charles? Uh, I think you were knighted in 2009, mm -hmm. yeah. if you could explain uh, a little bit about the process before we conclude yeah. the program. So in the UK the national honours are given every six months, uh, June they give it as birthday honours the, for the Queen mm -hmm. and in uh, New Year's award in December and it's a pyramidal system so they take 20 people either men or women as knight or dame and about 60 to 70 as commander of the British Empire, CBE. CBE. 
Right. Then they take order of the British Empire, which is about double that, and then MB is the last strata. So, so the knighthood, sir, or KB, KBE, yeah. CBE, OBE, and MBE. So it's a, it's like a pyramidal structure. Right. right. So there are committees. So you can't nominate yourself. Somebody has to nominate you, and there's a committee for sports, uh, architecture, science, medicine philanthropy and so on. So each committee looks at the applications and selects a certain number of people and puts it up to a main committee. They can make a recommendation, this person deserves a knighthood or something, but it's not final. The main committee consists of the chairs of the different committees and few cabinet members. So they will select the group, about two perhaps, as day or night from each of the disciplines. So two from medicine, two from science, two from engineering, two from law, etc., etc. And then about five or six for CBE and so on, and they build the list up. So if you get within the 20 top peer, then you get either knight or not, and then more. And it's called Knight Bachelor because you can't pass the award to your children. I see. It's like um, Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Science. You can't pass it down to your generation. Yes. But your son or your male generations are permitted to keep the... You are asked to give a design of your logo or something, which they have an interview, if you're a knight, not for the other degrees. And so you say you were born in Jaffna, you went to this temple, your wife brought roses and jasmine, your father was this, you were that, and they put a design for your logo. Right. And they put a crest, which... Uh, Motto. So I put service and sacrifice as my motto, and they give it to you. Of course, you had to pay for that. Of course, <laughs> yeah. But that can be passed on to. That can be passed on. The only thing is that the same logo cannot be used by the son. He has to change the color of one of the bands slightly differently and register. That's interesting. Uh, really interesting. So, so I, I, I think it's a nice thing to have and. Of course. Of course, they give you a big certificate on leather, put in the logo and so forth. And and that's that's the Knight Bachelor from Her Majesty the Queen in the UK, the, the Sri Lanka Ranjana uh, Award. What was the, uh, do you get a, uh, like a, a point? No, they give you a coin, uh, a lot of uh, semi-precious stones with a bundle and, and a certificate and so on. So that was proposed by the Colombo Medical School and supported by the Sri Lankan College. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took it up and said, yeah, I've done enough work to help both organizations. And, and that's awarded by the president, president whoever the president yeah. at the time. That's right. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. And which year did you get the Sri Lanka Ranjana Award? 2019. All oh, right. So 2009 you were knighted by the Queen. Ten years later you were awarded or conferred the Sri Lanka Ranjana that's uh, Award. That's that's. I'm impressed, Saru. But more importantly, you have been an inspiration throughout, not on this program, the content, but uh, for not just Sri Lankans uh, in the UK, but Sri Lankans in Sri Lanka, uh, and in Singapore, as well as across the international community. So I thank you so much for your service, which is also your motto in your uh, uh, the, the logo. The logo. Yeah. Uh, if we can, I'm not sure, I will talk to our producers here, uh, I would like to put your crest and the logo at the end of this program or at the start of the program, Sure. if sure. that's possible that's and possible. technologically as well, I, I'm, I will, we will check that after the program. So thank you for being an inspiration, a mentor and also an asset holder uh, to an asset person for Sri Lanka. Thank so, you very much for having me. Thank you again. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. And thank you for the listeners. Thank you. Thank you. So we come to another program of Connect with Rohan Dialvis, uh, brought to you from the studios of Satyajit Creations in London. Uh, keep watching and um, we will come to you with some more programs uh, uh, which will be of an interesting nature uh, and an overall nature that you can uh, hopefully benefit. Thank you.